Well, again, thank you for having me here. I'm Jerry Schnaff, the Executive Director of Keep Iowa Beautiful, and again, to introduce my wife, Pat Schnaff, and if you've not uh, met her, she makes sure that I stay awake when I drive and uh, keep alert. And Pat and I were up to Lake Park, Iowa, which is about as far from here as you can get last night. So we were on the road quite a bit, uh, and a short night uh, for her anyway, <laughs> a short one for me too. Um, I want to talk the first few minutes here. I'm going to go back through some of the things I talked about when I was down here before. And I'm really glad to have Fairfield on as an affiliate and to work with us. Because I think you'll get some benefits out of it and I'll go through some of those in more detail. First part is going to be more philosophical about why you do this. And the second part we can spend a little more time in detail talking about benefits and planning for what you're going to do in your community things like that. I would tell you it's, you know, the nice part for me, I know a little bit of history on Fairfield. I know that this is the first golf course west of the Mississippi River. I know that Fairfield is a pretty progressive community in its history. And progressive, it had another first, uh, which you probably also know, the first lighted uh, baseball game, I think, took place in Fairfield, Iowa and a lot of other first. So it just indicates that you're a really progressive community and the idea of focusing on your image of your community is equally progressive and important. I would also tell you that Keep Iowa Beautiful is a national, part of a national organization. We're part of Keep America Beautiful and I'm going to talk about that later on and make sure you understand the opportunity there if you want to in terms of affiliation also with the national. But I'll go through that a little bit later. Um, the other thing, the national organization, Keep America Beautiful, focuses on beautification. They focused on waste reduction, recycling, litter prevention, and beautification objectives. Iowa, in our case, we do not focus on waste reduction or recycling because there are good organizations out there that are targeted for doing that. The Iowa Recycling Association is a good partner with us, so if you need or want any help on the recycling side, that, that will be the source for getting that information. We spend, uh, in, in terms of waste reduction, you have all the sanitary landfill regions around here that can offer all that kind of assistance. So we focus on working with affiliates like yourselves. We focus on litter-free schools, we focus on encouraging litter-free events, and we focus on the issue of illegal dumping, and I'll talk more about that later. And we focused on increased public awareness to the issue of the importance of beautification in improving the image of your community. The concept that's used nationally is the concept of what's called the broken window theory. I went through that a little bit and talked about that. If a building is left, and a window gets broken in that building, if it's not repaired instantly, or rather quickly, it sends the message that the rest of the windows are free to break. And when that happens, that's generally what occurs. The windows do get broken, the building goes downhill, a lot of things can happen then in that building, and it may impact the community or the area in which the building's located. Now it's called the broken window theory because the broken window is a symbol. It's a symbol of a lack of pride and respect in your community. And if you do not deal with those symbols that reflect the lack of pride and respect, it says that you're not proud of your community. Those symbols can also be, for example, fences that are run down, parking lots that are not maintained, buildings that are unpainted. Uh, it can be signage that's not kept up. It can be all of those things. It can be litter, it can be debris that's accumulated, it can be public nuisances on property. All of those things represent symbols of a lack of pride and respect in the community. And you know and I know as we talk about it, the image of a community is e awfully important to you. Your first impression when you drive into a new town, your first impression when you were at Cabo San Lucas was? You look at the, everything around you. Yeah, and you see probably, as we do in our travels, a lot of debris and litter, for example. We just came through Arkansas and, and uh, Louisiana. 
And it's funny, they have high penalties, but they have high degrees of litter. So it means that they're probably not enforcing the litter laws in their case. So it isn't always how high the penalty is that becomes important. The enforcement issue becomes important in the case of litter and the illegal dumping. On, on, on that image, sometimes in a community, you're almost too close to it. The old expression, you can't see the forest for the trees, you become too ac accepted or you accept things that you wouldn't accept when you drive into another community. And somehow you kind of slip into that. So sometimes what you may have to do is, is have an outsider look at your community with you and give you a different set of eyes about your, your town and your neighborhoods. And I'll tell you this, it's awfully important for economic development because again, the first image will make the determination of whether you want to do anything in that community or not. It will set the tone in your mind on how you feel about that community. And for someone that lives in a neighborhood that's run down and not cared for, imagine going past that every day, whether you're walking to school or whether you're driving by, what it does to the mind. It makes you less of a person in terms of your standards. Your standards just suddenly start lowering and pretty soon it's, it's what they call moral kind of decay occurs. So when you look at Mayor Giuliani in New York City or the new mayor or the new uh, enforcement officer in Los Angeles, the chief of police there, he said, I'm gonna focus my time on the small laws, jaywalking, turnstile jumping, litter, debris, public nuisance abatement, uh, window wipers on the street going out there and trying to wash your windows. He said, I'm gonna focus on all those kinds of things because if I can deal with small laws, and I can deal with them, I have trouble dealing with big laws, the homicides and all of that. So what happens is the broken window theory goes into effect. They start enforcing the small laws. The small laws lead to the big problems if you don't deal with them. It sets the tone. So what happens is in Los Angeles in one year's time, through strict enforcement of the small laws, homicide rates drop by almost 20% because it sends the message that we're serious about our community. So again, I'm spending, I don't want to dwell on this, but in terms of public nuisance abatement or litter abatement or illegal dumping, really almost one of the strongest solutions is enforcement. You know, you can do a fair amount of education and we need to back in the schools, but enforcement becomes the critical kind of part to it. So uh, again, if you can work on those small laws and work with your enforcement community, and I would encourage your committee to do that, you know, as you work along here, to work with the enforcement community very strongly. Uh, so enough on that. What, what it really means is, you know, you can do the quick things. You can paint a building, you can fix a fence, you can mow weeds, you can clean up an area, and generally you can do that in a few hours or a day. You can change the image of your town or your community, and that may take years to do to change the behavior pattern of the residents and of society takes decades. So you need to start doing it right now. To not tolerate things that happen. Pat and I just came back from Spain. And they, we have what, a 20% smoking rate? I think in the US, something like that, 20, 24%. Europe, it's 35%. And when we walked around, we were in Barcelona and Sitges, Spain, you very seldom saw a cigarette butt on the ground. I couldn't believe it. The community and the, and the nation, at least the part we're in, was extremely clean. And what happens is, I watched a smoker. And the smoker does what they used to call in military terms, field stripping. They put the cigarette out, 
Then they wrap, take the paper off and roll that paper up into just a tiny little thing. That they do throw away. Then they break up all the tobacco and scatter it because it'll degrade. The filter then they put into a waste receptacle. I mean, I was really amazed. This isn't just one person, it's all of them doing that. So where did that come from? Came from an ethic, came from a training somewhere in the process. So I call all this business, if we don't focus on it now, I call it the dressing down of America. We have become so casual in how we do things. We have very informal processes. In many cases, it's not black and white anymore. We got all shades of gray. I'm waxing a little bit philosophically here. But uh, we don't have time for anybody anymore. We don't follow any rules or etiquette of common courtesies. Now, I'm overstating the case. There's lots of young people that are doing a great job, too. But by and large, we've got to do some work on this. And uh, I would tell you, back on the issue of litter, I'll, I'll spend a little time on that. You know you've heard me talk about it. We did a major study. It's almost a quarter of a million dollars worth of research, probably the most sophisticated research in the United States on litter and attitudes and understanding and enforcement issues. On an attitudinal survey, which the Iowa Department of Transportation mailed out, and it was a four-page survey, and they received a response rate of 46.7%. And everybody had to put their own postage back on it, fill out that form, that was an amazing thing in my mind that Iowans have that strong a commitment to the issue. They've never had a rate returned like that. So it tells me, God, they're really excited about Iowa. Then when you look at the actual survey, 70 to 80 percent of Iowans litter and feel it's okay to throw out a cigarette butt, to throw out a wrapper, and those kinds of things. And frankly, what, what, what really is occurring, most Iowans think it's the 16 to 26 year old that's doing it. Now what this comes from is in schools. I believe strongly that schools at athletic and sport events are training youngsters to throw things down. So if, you, if I had one target for you is to work with the school district and try to get the physical education director or the superintendent or the administrator to say let's make these events litter free let's not be throwing stuff down we've let it we've tolerated that we've let it happen because it's easier than to to get at the children let's just hire janitors and pay them to do it well huh guess what it's doing sending wrong messages all the way so we really got to focus with those with the schools and the younger generation. Uh, a lot of Iowans in that attitudinal survey, they don't want public service announcements telling them, uh, you know, messages from Bob Ray or Governor Vilsack or so on saying, here's what you ought to do. They want us to enforce the laws. So again, I'll talk more on it later, how I've been trying to work with the Chiefs of Police Association and the Sheriff's Association and making some progress with them. So it's an interesting uh, project. We also did a background survey by a firm out of Kansas City to find out what's it cost Iowans. And frankly, it costs you about $13.5 million a year as taxpayers to simply pick up litter. That doesn't mean sweep or things like that or clean up areas, but simply to pick up litter. And for schools, out of that $13.5 million, $3.5 million is the cost for schools to pick it up in their, in their grounds and in their schools themselves. We spend less than $300,000 on enforcement or education. So we've resigned ourselves to become janitors rather than stewards by preventing it from happening. So the real issue is to change behavior patterns to move toward prevention techniques. I don't want to go out there and do cleanups all my life that's not my ambition unless you can get a little bit of education out of it and that doesn't happen again. So anyhow, again, that's a little background on the background survey. All of this is on our webpage too. 
uh, that you can get to in more depth and there's more data there than I'll ever use or ever need to use. But it gives me the right kind of background for uh, working with communities and working with enforcement entities. The third part was a physical survey of litter. And a third of the litter is tobacco related products. A third of it. And a third is paper, plastics, and fast food items that you find. And if I were to give you a profile of a litterer, it is, and you've heard me talk on this, it is a Mountain Dew drinking, Snicker eating, Marlboro smoking, Bud Light drinking, fast food eating individual. Now does that give you a profile? And if you say it's me, <laughs> it probably could be, but mostly what again it's relating to is younger generations. And what's happened here is we've, we've avoided having any kind of program in the schools probably for about 20 to 30 years. Now there's some exceptions to that, but generally there's not been a litter prevention kind of program. Litter prevention, again, litter is a symbol it's the simplest single one thing that you can get people's attention with. It's having them take an action. Everybody can do that. There isn't any reason not to do it. Not to be intolerant of littering and people that are doing it. So what I'm going to do in, uh, uh, again as I said, we're more interested I think in becoming janitors than we are in remediation of the problem. Working with communities like uh, size of Fairfield in public nuisance abatement with property, private properties, that's a tough issue. Probably one of the toughest facing a small town. Issues of illegal dumping are tough because they're, they're a sightless crime. No one sees them, you know, and they occur. So how do you go about preventing them? I want to go through just a quick listing of some of the things that are beneficial to you. I think one of them you already heard about apparently was announced. You did get the grant for the Paint Iowa Beautiful program. I think you got 25 gallons of, uh, of paint uh, as a result of that through Diamond Vogel Paint Company. Now frankly that, that's a benefit of being affiliated because we had almost 100 applications to the thing. And so bottom line it kind of sorts out as being a subjective decision. We got down to about oh, 45, and then it really became tough <laughs> in doing it. And uh, so I'm happy that you, you got that as one of your kind of first uh, opportunities. We have a uh, program that we're doing now, which you have another opportunity. It's through the checkoff. And we we're just talking about where Iowans, individuals check off on their income tax. This is not public funds. It's not state of Iowa money, it's private taxpayers on the state income tax form agree to check off one of three things. They can check off for the state fair, it's called the corn dog check off. They can check off for the DNR non-game program which is called the chickadee check off or they can do the Keep Iowa Beautiful check off. Frankly, they're all three good. So, but I really encourage you to pick Keep Iowa Beautiful as a check off because it's the only program that the monies come back to the communities. Now this last year we increased up to about $65,000 that people checked off. I think we've got a much higher potential, but we've only been at it a couple years. Now the other ones, like DNR and those and the State Fair, they've been at it for like eight, nine, almost a dozen years with the DNR. And the fair is at maybe 90000 and uh, the uh, Chickadee checkoff, I think, is maybe at 125 or 130. So I think with a little more effort now in the next uh, couple of years, we'll get these figures up. 70% of that money then comes back to communities around the state. Now this year, I think we gave awards to about 25 Iowa communities for a wide range of beautification projects. Everything from uh, doing landscape design for entryways to a community to painting and improving a park, you know, just so it's a whole range of projects. You can almost let your mind go in that uh, program uh, with it. So I would encourage you, the checkoff is a fairly easy. Now, it, there were more people applied for free paint than there was for the checkoff. 
Yeah, and I would encourage more people in the chat box. Your probabilities are pretty good in that one. Now, it's not huge money. You also need to know that. It's maybe in the range of $1,500 to $5,000 for each one, but very good. Now, we also do a project. Uh, it's called the Great American Cleanup, which is part of the national organization. So that's in March, April, and May. It's three months in which they focus on doing cleanup projects in communities. And if you do that, I can provide you all kinds of free materials. Banners, posters, gloves, garbage bags, you know, all those kinds of things uh, that help carry out a cleanup. And you can, if you do a, a project and it's registered with the national, you can get some national coverage on it. Uh, through the through Keep America Beautiful. Uh, I would, shifting off of that one a little bit, and we can come back to visit on any of those. We've got a program on which we're focusing on schools. It's called Litter Free School Program. And it's Litter Free School Campuses. And there's two parts to it. An administrator agrees to try to make their campus litter free. And so they can do that without having any education efforts. They can try to work with their staff and their faculty and really just focus on cleanup programs. The second part, however, is we have a K-12 program that's now being developed. And the K-12 program is broken down into K-2, 3, 5, 6, 8 in high school. And at the K-2, it's just merely public awareness. It's for the youngster to understand what is litter and how to differentiate it. So we have coloring books that are all going to be on an electronic basis. And by the way, this whole material is being developed by a retired school superintendent and principal and a retired teacher. And then along with it, I have a representative from the Department of Education. I have an education intern. And just as a side story, I kept getting emails from a lady down in Burlington with General Electric saying, why don't you apply for a grant? And I kept, well, I didn't have a, frankly, I don't know why I didn't respond to her quicker. I kept putting those messages away. Sure, I'll give it some thought, you know. Finally, I thought, I better phone this lady. She works at General Electric down there, and General Electric uh, has a foundation. And, and I said, well, why should I apply? I, I'm one person. I don't know that I can get this done in your time frame and all of that. And she says, here's the issue. General Electric does not accept applications for grants. When I phoned you or emailed you and asked you to submit, you're already part way there in the acceptance. Wow, that surprised me. So I got a grant in. Lo and behold, we got a $100,000 grant from General Electric to help develop this education program for schools. So now we have some substance to it. We have a game developer uh, that was provided by Casey's General Stores. And we have also an illustrator that's putting the illustration to all of this material. And it is some of the most creative material you've seen. And we're focusing heavily on Iowa and we're using our symbols of our state, like it's Glenn and, and Gloria Goldfinch, our, our couple mm -hmm. symbols. It's Jerry Geode, the rock star. You know, it's that kind of thing. A little bit corny, but it's catchy. It's the right kind of thing for, uh, for young uh, K-235 people. And they pick out some education out of this thing. Now, we have to put all that material, which has already been written, now against benchmarks and standards for teachers. Well, guess what? Now another education process here. Iowa is the only state in the nation that does not have uniform benchmarks and standards for teachers. You can pick them up wherever you want and use them. Every other state has a state standard. So we finally found a set of benchmarks and standards that tends to be used by all the schools. So we can put every activity measured against one of those benchmarks and standards. So it becomes important so teachers know what's being taught by that particular activity. A simple thing like there's an Iowa map on the cover and says, put a spot where you live. 
See, it's just a geographic exercise. It's a little minor, little kind of a thing. But anyhow, when you see this material, we're testing it this year with eight schools. So if you had a school that would be willing to send a teacher, three teachers and an administrator to a four-day session in June, let me know. We're going to have capacity for eight schools. I think we have four or five of those already on board. And they'll... It will be in June. It's four days in June. I don't have the... Yeah. Yeah, and they actually... Three teachers. And they actually get paid to come to this training. So it's not as though uh, it's a freebie in the... It, let's see, it could be K-2, it could be middle school, it could be uh, high school. Doesn't matter. Just so it's a, a specific kind of a campus. And we want to test out the materials in all levels. So we want to make sure we got a K-2, 3, 5, 6, 8. And in high school, it's based upon what's called community action programs. And what that means is that the students get credit or recognized for their contribution to public service around a plan that maybe you've developed. And maybe you already have that in the schools, do you know? Is there a recognition program for public service? Yes. Yeah. Okay. High school, uh, high school level. At high school level. Yes. Yeah. You are required to complete 15 hours. Are you? Yeah, like a gold braid right. or something, yeah. Well, what, what I'm encouraging you to do is relate your plan to those schools, to the high schools, so that they can use that as their eligible public service projects. Pick out projects where you can get the seniors involved and give them extra, you know, give them extra attention, recognition for doing that. So you can tie to the school system and maybe give some special things. I'd, I don't know enough about the system, but I think there's a good way to reinforce for a youngster the kinds of things that you're looking for in your plans. Uh, I would tell you, and I've got all this kind of material, which I think I had before, but it's over here on the table too, some of it. Uh, we have some litter-free events. We've got the state fair has become a litter-free event. Uh, this year is their 150th anniversary. Uh, so we're going to be doing some special things there as well at the State Fair. Uh, we've been working with the Board of Regents on making sure that they uh, get their campuses as litter-free. Don't comment about Ames right now, I'm not going <laughs> to, but again, a little bit of an issue there. But the Ames campus, they did a survey of their students and faculty administration, said it's a key issue on their campus has to do with litter. I find that interesting. Out of all the issues they could have identified, they see that as the single most negative thing on their campus. So anyhow, we'll be working with them. Um, we've got with the Iowa Cubs, uh, and you could use this at athletic events, we got a program called the Trash Dash for Cash. And it gets the, the participant in the audience involved in, in whoever collects the most litter and debris in three innings. Uh, wins a $50 cash prize or something. Well, what's it doing? It's telling people, let's prevent it from happening. Let's quit, you know, throwing it down. And it's starting to work. I've seen in their case, it's reducing the cost for maintenance at the, at the Cubs games. Uh, we're looking at developing a uh, litter-free events kit, and that'll be on the internet on our webpage pretty quick. That will give you, again, all these materials you talked about, uh, bags, gloves, uh, litter-free event guidelines, all these kinds of things will be on there. There's loan materials will be available to you for recycling, waste reduction, uh, projects, products that you can borrow for an event, uh, portable and disposable waste receptacles, portable and dis disposable recycling receptacles, all those kinds of things. Uh, and if you're looking at buying tongs or pickup tongs or things like that, that'll be on this catalog as well. 
Uh, we are just entered into a contract with the Iowa DNR. When you were talking earlier about the illegal dumping, we have a quarter of a million dollar contract for this year between Keep Iowa Beautiful and DNR to do major pilot projects in three communities. And we just finished selecting those communities. A small community is Appanoose, which is 25,000 and under. 25,000 to 100 was selected was Boone. And the third one is a large community, 100,000 plus, was Lynn County. Now, it's interesting to note that Lynn County is Keep Lynn County Beautiful. Boone is Keep Boone County Beautiful. Appanoose is not affiliated, but they were the small applicant. So again, another little advantage, and we'll be testing out all kinds of approaches to dealing with illegal dumping. Heavy emphasis on enforcement. How do we do it? We've been working with uh, the sheriffs, and believe it or not, at their last statewide meeting, they adopt a resolution in support of their efforts to help in litter reduction and illegal dumping prevention. So, now I don't expect that to instantly turn into a lot of things, but it's a nice statement and it's a nice endorsement for them. Uh, I would encourage you, and maybe talked about this before, we do with Nebraska, the state of Iowa and Nebraska do a joint conference, and that's October 20th through the 22nd. And it's a half day, a full day, and half a day. And it's over in Nebraska City. It's kind of right between uh, the two states. And it's at the Lead Conservation Center, which if, have any of you ever been there? You've been there. It is the most spectacular place. And there's all kinds of events. You can make it a family weekend if you want there because they've got great golf courses. It's part of the Arbor Day Foundation. That's where Arbor Day started, and it started with the home of Sterling Morton, which is right there. So all of this is right in this, and this lodge is absolutely spectacular. Huge, huge facility, most environmental conscious facility probably in the country, and how it's dealt with, and you don't even really know what's happening uh, around there. Everything, for example, it's fueled by wood grown on the property, and all kinds of things. Uh, it's October 20th through the 22nd. I encourage you to send some representatives there. And, uh, you know, I don't know that I've got lots of dollars, but if you felt you can't do it, registration won't be high, won't be expensive. I can't tell you exactly what it'll be, but that won't be the key issue. The key issue will be your travel there and your time in the hotel. That'll be the expense. So I encourage you because we get about 80 to 100 people from different communities around both Nebraska and Iowa. And it's probably one of the best little workshops and conferences that you can go to. I mean, great interchange of information. Uh, lastly, uh, in our research efforts, we focus uh, right now, we're gonna focus on a program with the DNR and the Preserves Board and the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation about identification of the most scenic areas in Iowa. So we're working on that kind of a, of a process. Uh, we're also doing one on the economic importance of improving your community. There is no data. We tend to think that if you've got a good image community and it improves economic development, well, we need to really be able to say that it does. So we're looking at doing some base research on that. So, you know, with that, it's, that's a quick, again, kind of an overview of the program. And uh, then after this, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what you're doing in your community and doing some planning, that kind of thing. Uh, again, you know, you really have to develop an attitude of not tolerating things and behavior patterns and let people know. That doesn't mean you go stop someone in a car that you don't know and pull them out and, and tell them I saw you throw up. <laughs> but I can tell you, I. Well, Pat and I was out in front of my place and a, someone pulled up there and they were waiting for someone else and the woman dropped out a cigarette butt. And I said, excuse me. I said, you dropped something here. Oh, she says, I'm sorry. And she went out and got it. But you know, I mean, it's just a simple thing, but that's what you gotta do all the time. 
with people that are doing it. So, anyhow, that will, should we break now? Good enough? Great. Okay. Thank Good. you. Thank you.